He's coming in. He's coming in. Give him a minute. Well, we got five of us. That's enough anyways. And more people might join. And uh, glad you guys are here. I hope uh, this helps you out today. <coughs> Just waiting for Alex. Uh, he's on here. I don't know if you see his box, but he's probably trying to push some buttons and get his video working. There he is. <laughs> ah, he got it going. All right, man. All right. I'm in. You're in. I was just calling you. I was waiting for you, man. Hey, uh, yeah, well, so let's just go ahead and start this meeting. So you guys know I'm I'm you know who I am. I'm 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 Sean, and uh I did uh, my 52 month sentence at Florence, Colorado with this guy, Alex here. And Alex uh said he'd come on and uh be our little speaker for the support group that I, I'm calling it pre-trial anonymous. We could always change the name, but I appreciate you guys coming on, and I know you guys are going through pre-trial hell. So I'm trying to get different people every week that been through what you've been through and, uh, you know, ha have lived to the other end. And uh, so Alex gave me some good news today. He just got early release uh, from, from, from his probation early. So congratulations, man. Thank you. So I'm going to give you guys, Alex, I'm going to shut up, Alex, wherever you want to start from. And, you know, it's kind of these guys are all going through – None of them have been sentenced yet. I don't know. Some of them might have been sentenced yet, but, uh, you know, they're going through all that, that hell we went through. And, if, you know, just tell your story and whenever, you know, and then we'll, we'll all talk about it after. I'm going to shut up and mute myself. Hey, what's up, guys? So I'm Alex. So first, I want to say that whatever you're feeling right now, this is the worst part of it all. Pre-trial was by far the worst experience of the whole process. So what it will only get better from here. Um, incarceration is really not that bad. It was actually, I mean, sur sure, there were some bad days out there, but for the most part, prison sentence was actually kind of easy. Probation was fairly easy also. Pre-trial was by, in my experience, was by far the worst. They were harassing me. They were coming to my house way more often than they were during my probation period. You know, drug tests were way more, frequent than probation period um so you know whatever you guys are feeling right now and if you guys think this is as low as it gets it is this is as low as it gets it will from now on one you know it, it will get easier and it will get better um you know i definitely recommend passing all drug tests during pre-trial period my co-defendant he ended up failing like five drug tests during pre-trial period he got uh, his bond revoked and he went to he was in custody during sentencing the judge ended up throwing like 18 extra months on top of what he was going to get just because of those five failed drug tests so it's very important that you guys pass your drug test now even though it's probably difficult it was definitely difficult for me but uh you know it was very important it helped out a lot um so and you know like i said in my case one guy got it extra 18 months unnecessary just for those stupid drug tests um so pass your drug test now once you get into prison i'm telling you it was easy like when sean makes all these videos on club club fed shit was easy dude like i mean it was a joke you're gonna make a ton of friends it was kind of fun like there's a million fun activities to get into it was definitely not hell you know yes you're away from your family yes you're away from your friends yes you're sober all, none of those things are fun, but, but, but other than that, there's all kinds of fun shit going on. You know, there's plenty to do. If you got hobbies, it's going to be easy. You know, if you like, you know, whether it's playing sports, working out, reading, playing music, uh, you know, arts and crafts, there's so many, whatever, seriously, it's whatever you guys like, there's going to be availability. Shit was easy. Um, but pre-trial is the hardest period. So whatever you guys got to do to pass all your drug tests and follow the line. So I just got off probation on Friday, two days ago, and they get, I got off one year early. They gave me three years. I ended up doing two. Um, so I never failed a drug test. Um, and I pretty much never had like a write-up in prison or anything. So 
and in pretrial, I never had a mess up. So all those things worked in my favor. So we submitted to the judge saying, hey, we'd like to get off probation early. And here is why. And then I wrote, you know, never, you know, passed all drug tests during pretrial, never had a write up in prison, never had a write up at the halfway house, never had an issue during probation. And then basically all those things, that was enough. That, and then I got one year off probation. So now I'm free. Um, so I definitely suggest, you know, and now believe me, I'm the last person to suggest following all the rules, but a pre-trial, I would definitely follow the rules and just get it done because it get from once this is over, like I said, it gets easier. This is as hard as it gets. Pre-trial is the worst. You don't know what's coming. You don't know, like everybody's got, you know, some you know, idea of what prison's going to be like, and there's going to be all this violence and all this bullshit. None of that's true. Prison's like actually like a summer camp. It's fun. There's going to be a bunch of cool people. Like it's going to, it's a joke, you know? So don't trip. If you guys are worried, you know, don't, you know? So I, I guess that's all I got for now. Sean. <laughs> Let me unmute my. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Alex. Thanks a lot. Alex. I mean, maybe some, questions will jog your memory and stuff but uh yeah passing those drug tests uh i failed a couple drug tests on pretrial guys i got lucky they let me go do a, a drug treatment program so i had to do a six month attack therapy type program in 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 uh, berkeley california called newbridge where they made it so um you, you got no phone calls no newspapers no tv you don't never leave the place you leave it one time to go for a physical at a hospital, but they would have to have us stand in front of a mirror for half an hour with our hands at our side, staring at our, so we can't scratch our face. You can't adjust your clothing. You can't look away. You can't, you stare at that mirror whenever you mouthed off to somebody, you know, whenever you didn't obey a rule. I mean, if you didn't tuck in your shirt, go stand in the mirror for 30 minutes. And, and if, and if I didn't do that, they, there's the door and they'll call the marshals and I go get locked up in detention. You know, I go I go to county jail until I get sentenced. And my pretrial lasted four years. By the time I would have got sentenced from county jail, I would have never went to prison. I would have done all my time in the county jail. Uh, I mean, I didn't know any of that at the time. But so I stood in front of that mirror a lot of days and I I made it through that program, you know, but um, I got lucky. Some people don't get to go to a program. They like Alex co-defendant there. He didn't pass. Um, I failed two tests. Uh, he, he said he failed five tests. So, but yeah, that's what happens. Now I haven't failed any tests since I've been to prison and out of prison and all that. So yeah, the drugs are five years out of my system now. So yeah. Anybody got questions out there? Yeah. I like how I said prison was easy. I bet it, it probably is when you're, when you're dealing with a camp. But the worst thing is, I guess, not only waiting to be sentenced for me, it's just like not knowing where I'm going to be at, either a medium or a, a low. I know I don't think I'll be able to get a camp because I have too many tickets, man. But they're not warrants. But they're, they're you know, driving with license revoked. And I did prison time. And they allowed me to get out of prison, state prison. I mean, my case manager called them and they were all like, man, we're not worried about that shit. Let them go. So do you still think that would hold me up? Well, here's the thing. The, the fact that you're talking to me right now and you're not locked up in a detention center uh, tells me that you're not a flight risk. Uh, I haven't heard of anybody self-surrendering to a medium. Have you, Alex? No. So I've heard of people self-surrendering to a low or a camp, but they don't usually, if you're in a medium, you're locked if you're going to a medium or a penitentiary, you're locked up in the county jail the whole time, unless like a two million dollar bail. But I mean, are you out on a million dollar bail or something like that? No, nah, no. Nah, okay. They don't even. They don't even. They, this is crazy. They don't even piss me anymore. I mean, so they had me doing alcohol testing and along with drug testing, and I did it for maybe about seven or eight months. But the last three, four, three months, three, four months, they ain't. They don't. They don't even call me to come in, and so they don't even come to my house. You're probably going to a low security prison then. What do you think, Alex? Absolutely. Um, everybody that would, at least from my case and my experience, everybody who self-surrendered and was out on bond went to a camp or a low. 
Cool. I know I you're not going to a penitentiary. Yeah, I know I'm not going to a penitentiary. <laughs> yeah, I ain't that, that ain't that bad. And I'm telling um, you, man, the camp is a joke. It's easy money. It's a joke. It's like you're gonna play sports with your friends, play some cards, play yeah, some it sounds like, a bunch of delicious snacks. You know, it's easy money. Yeah. It sounds like the time I did, I did 30 months in state green clothes in North Carolina. It was uh it was like that. It was pretty laid back. Okay. okay. Kind of sounds like it was kind of like a kind of like a camp setting too. But they had a fence, razor fence. <laughs> but I totally agree, man. I, I remember um Sean when you said uh that you 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 would have been relieved that even the judge gave you 10 years because of the stress of just leading up. Lord knows I don't want 10 years and nothing like that, but I know once I finally get the damn sentence, it'll be a lot of weight off me because this is just the worst for me because I'm just waiting to they need to set a sentencing date. For me, and and my shit's moved pretty fast, man. It's been about a almost this month will be a, the seventh of this month will be a year that I got my indictment. So my shit moved pretty fast. You know, not not knowing is 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 is, is it what kills you. You know, it, 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 in the back of your mind, you know you're going to prison. You know you're not getting probation. I mean, we yes, all man. hope and pray for it, and your family and friends say, "Oh, you'll get probation." But you know you're not going to get it, man. We we know we're not getting that. We just don't know how many years in prison. So your life's on hold, you know, until this judge nope. tells tells you how how long you're going to do, you know. Hey, Alex, do you have a restitution? I had a five thousand dollar fine, but I paid that off. Like one of, one of my my brother actually paid it off the day I self surrendered. Okay, because I was told I can't get early release because of my restitution. I mean, did you think that's a factor always or what? I mean, I know that my lawyer in, in our motion to get probation terminated early wrote that I paid off my fine. I know that that's something he yeah. wrote. In the letter, yeah. so. And I put in my paperwork on a Tuesday and I was off on Friday. So it was only a three day process. That's fast. I didn't know that. I would yeah, figure they I couldn't they, believe it. Yeah, the feds, I don't, I've never heard of the feds move that fast. I couldn't believe it. Wow. They they actually can move. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah, so I live in San Diego in Southern California. So literally on Friday at like 5 p.m. I found out I was off probation at like 7 p.m. I was already in Tijuana, Mexico <laughs> celebrating. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Now, do you have to go to a court hearing for to get off probation, or you just no? I didn't have thing? to go. I didn't even realize it was happening. I, I paid my lawyer on Monday. I told him to start the process. I assumed it was going to take like two months, is what I was thinking. You know, he didn't quote me a time. So on Tuesday, I paid him the on Monday. I paid him the money. Tuesday, he submitted the paperwork, and then so I'm thinking a couple of more months, you know. And then all of a sudden on Friday, 5 p.m., he sent me an email saying congratulations you're a free man do not contact probation you don't you're not on probation anymore and then he wow. had a little attachment from the judge that was signed off and i was like oh shit Ooh. So i went home i came home took a quick shower and went to mexico to celebrate <laughs> it's over so how many years were you on pre-trial prison and probation what's the total five years okay five years out of your life okay yeah it was like six weeks short of five years yeah can I ask how much you had to pay your lawyer to get off probation? So, okay. So I paid a lot, but everybody else seems to be paying like 500 bucks. My guy quoted me 2000. I said, I did that. One of those like 2000, you know? And then yeah. he's like, why does that sound too much? I go, well, how about this? I'm like, how about I give you a thousand bucks right now? And if you win and when you win, I'll give you the other thousand. And he goes, deal. So I paid him the thousand bucks on Tuesday, on Monday. And then boom, on Friday we won. So I immediately sent him a Venmo payment of the other thousand because I felt like he did such a good job. I wasn't even going to haggle about the money. But so I paid 2000, which sounds, it's definitely more than what I hear my other friends paid, but I feel like okay. he got it done the quickest. All right. And did you, you use the same lawyer you had on free trial or did you a, a, a different yeah, one? Same, yeah, same one. Okay. All right. I'm just wondering for myself and right? others to get, I, I know you guys out there are uh, free trial could care less about probation right now. I, I remember I didn't even want to watch. Uh, when I was on pretrial, I was watching RDAP Dan, and there was a couple uh, guys, Walt Pablo, and they would talk about halfway house time. 
I didn't care about that. That's way in the future. I, I, I didn't even want to go to prison, so I could care less what happens at halfway house time. But now I'm getting calls from people asking about halfway house time. What, what's uh, Alan, what's going on with you, Alan? Uh, what, what kind of stage are you in on this process? You are uh, getting sent and getting ready to get sentenced. Have you been sentenced? Do you know what you're facing? That's okay. I guess he doesn't want to talk. How about Eric? Uh, you, you're just starting out, right? So you got a long way to go. Have they offered you any kind of timeline to look at? Uh, no, not yet. I know that only thing I know is for my charge that uh, it's a maximum of five years. So. Well, it's something. My attorney told me I'll probably do two years at least. Okay, that's not too bad. I mean, two days is too long. I get it, but uh, <laughs> at least you got something. I mean, yeah. I I was first told ten years, and then eight years, and then five, and then then they would tease me with probation, and then the lawyer would come back the next month. I never told you you're going to get probation. I never told you five years. Oh God. Yeah, I already know I'm not getting probation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at 20, 20 years. 20. But, uh, uh yeah, but, yeah, but uh, you know, that's that's what have the penalty of what could be, but they've already did my guidelines at a nine. Your guidelines are level nine? Yeah, I'm, the offense level is nine. But the offense level and nine, that's two. that's only a that's uh I got the charge on Six to twelve. Oh yeah, this is category three, right? Was that you? Category, category four. Four. Category four. Eight to fourteen. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. Well, how do you get eight to fourteen months compared to twenty years? That's a big difference. I mean, explain that. It's uh, because my what 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 I'm charged with can carry up to twenty years, but the way that it was done, you know, it breaks down to either offense level of 30 then it has office level of 19 then it goes down to office level of nine mine was the lower of the charges but yeah. it can give you but it can give you up to 20 years but you know it depends on what was done yeah and so with the prosecutor with the plea agreement prosecutor well said that she would um she would stay within the guidelines of offense level nine minus two for acceptance Okay. Drop down to a seven. But, oh, you know, even a seven. That's yes, a possible a pro. That's possibly probation, man. Believe it or not. Yes. I, yeah, I mean, not, not, not with my, not, not with my criminal record. I, you know what I mean. Uh, I just, oh, okay, so they're gonna punish you. Yeah. Maybe I mean, maybe they give you six months or a year and a day, but uh, you're gonna be in and out, man. And you're not going to. Yeah, that's a low security. They wouldn't even send you to a a medium for that. Um, that it takes them longer than not just to just to book you at a medium. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. As long as the P even if the PSR comes back when I'm a level five, it's it's uh, then it changes from twelve to eighteen. My guidelines will be twelve to eighteen. It's but still not know, bad. It's up, yeah, it's still not bad. But it's like you know, you, well, you already know it's still up to the judge. The judge, you know, has a big. He come in with a not a, not in a good mood. You know what I'm saying? It could be it could be bad. Right. I think, Alex, yeah. Alex what, what, what's your take on sentencing day uh, when you uh, the letters you write to the judge and what you say to the judge and all that? Do you think that makes a difference or has the judge already made his mind up on that day? So honestly, I didn't like the letters. It seemed that everyone who read letters in court in front of me, like the judge was like not even listening. They were like the, uh, the people who were reading the letters, the defendants who were reading the letters were like, bad at reading or something and they just didn't sound good it just sounded like monotone and it sounded like the judge was bored and he was like not he wasn't digging the letters I freestyled my speech it was short and sweet I was like hey uh, you know first I want to apologize to the court to the my family to the general public yes I made a mistake blah 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 mine was like a 30 second speech it was all freestyle I didn't even prepare it I think and I feel like the judge liked it more than the people who are reading these five page letters. You know, the longer the letters, the more they were getting bored and like kind of their attention span wasn't that long. And I noticed that. So um, I didn't 
prepare a letter and I'm glad I didn't because it seemed like everyone who prepared one didn't get the love from the judge. Like my co-defendant, uh, he wrote like a long ass letter, read it like sh it sounded like shit. I mean, it was written well, but he like read it like, you know, he didn't have any enthusiasm when he was reading it. It was boring. After like 30 seconds, everybody was over it, you know, and he was like flipping through the pages and didn't help him at all, you know, so I'm, I'm, I personally am against letters. So I agree. I, I say speak from the heart. That's what I tell everybody. I mean, you might write something out to practice, but when you, I, I don't think you should read anything to the judge. Speak from your heart. It's the only time you're going to get to look the judge in the eye. It's the only time he's ever going to hear, listen to you, you know? So what, you know what I mean? That's speak from the heart and just be honest, apologize, say, you know, and mean it and uh, ask for, you know, don't ask for probation, but ask for a second chance at life. Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at it, you know? Yeah. Uh, what do you think about people? Uh, I was going to say, uh, I, I've been getting a lot of questions lately, unless you guys got other questions, but the big questions I'm getting now is these people trying to, nickel and dime, i want to say nickel and dime in their time like i got a guy that calls me almost every day and he's got a a 24 month sentence but uh and he wants to, and he can't get the rdap but he wants to know how to get more time on and he wants to know about the first step act program and he wants to know halfway house time and home confinement and the cares act and can i have all my time done on home confinement instead can i get halfway house can I, he's trying to and i did all the math for him and you know i'm going you can you can take RDAP and get six months halfway house and four months off for your good time. That's minus 10 months. But what about the first step back? You're not long there long enough to get any first step at credits. And um, so I'm getting questions like that. So uh, tell me about let's start with home confinement, Alex. What do you know about people? How, how do you qualify for home confinement? So home confinement, I didn't qualify. I mean, I qualified and they acted like they were going to give it to me, but then they kept dragging it along and I never actually got home confinement but where I live in the southern district of California they got a you got to have a house phone and once you get a house phone you got to get a probation officer to show up at your house and do an inspection which I did all that and still didn't get it but they do an inspection make sure nothing shady is happening to the house it doesn't look like there's drugs being used or neighbors are shady or whatever and then that's it and then they say you're approved and then you have to wait you know, for a period of time until they actually send you to home. I was at the halfway house and I never did get sent to home confinement. My friends did, and but they said it wasn't that big a deal. Um, they, none of them loved it. No one said, oh, I'm so glad I got home confinement. They, it was still like you sitting at home and they still show up at your house, you know, every day or every other day to check on you. They constantly call your house phone at three in the morning at, in the afternoon all kinds of random hours making sure you're home it didn't sound amazing the halfway house was worse than prison i mean halfway house was cool because i mean the positives were you know you could go to work and eat at a restaurant or something but the actual living conditions of the halfway house compared to prison were terrible where i'm at in san diego because our halfway house was mixed with the county jail work fur furlough program so all these county jail people you know, they're doing chicken shit sentences like 30 days, you know, so they're all, you know, you know, it just us federal people who just got done doing a few years or so a lot of these guys just got done doing 10, 15 years, you know, and they're hanging out with some wannabe criminals who are doing 30 day chicken shit sentence from work, you know, work furlough in county jail, you know, they're like little 19 year old kid. Um, you know, there was just it wasn't that cool. There was a lot of like, issues, it was dirty, there was a lot of um, all kinds of shit halfway house sucked honestly if you're like at a camp like I was prison is way funner and way cooler than halfway house um, if I had if, if I knew what I know now I would just prefer to stay at the camp you know personally. I think I would have too and you know I was at the San Francisco halfway house and there was at least 20 child molesters in there we looked them up on that Megan's law and, and, and like the real hardcore kind that they would tie you know tie people tie little kids up and you know, hold them, hold them hostage and rape them and all that. And uh, it was a terrible place at halfway house. Like you said, I would have rather done my time at the camp, but uh, yeah, I did get to go to work and save some money. 
I got to do that. That was a good thing. Yeah, right. and then, uh, yeah, no, at the halfway house where I was at, there was a bunch of child molesters, too. I didn't even realize that because at camps, they don't allow sex offenders. Right. So I didn't really experience that, you know, I didn't even realize that was the thing. And then when I got to the halfway house, you know, I'm sitting there shooting the shit, smoking a cigarette with some random dude I just met. And somebody comes up to me and is like, hey, don't talk to that guy. That guy's a child molester. And I'm like, what? You know, like, what the fuck? Is that, that, is that even a thing? And apparently it was more of a thing than you can imagine. There was dozens yeah. of these people, 20, yeah. 30, you know, easy, you know, guys that are like 80 years old, from grandpas that are in there for, you know, I mean, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely yeah. something I've never experienced before, but it's there. Yeah. And there's a lot of them in the low securities, uh, TJ. So that's the one thing they got a fence and they got child, uh, they got the, you know, sex offenders, um, so that's probably the main difference between that and a camp. Uh, other than the price of cigarettes, oh, huh, Alex? <laughs> yeah. Hey, if you smoke cigarettes, camp, you know, I mean, honestly, I don't, rec- even though I smoked cigarettes the whole time I was there, but I don't, you know, you know, I don't re- re- encourage other people to do that. But camps, like literally, you know, as far as contraband goes, everything's there, you know, cell phones, drugs, cigarettes, alcohol, um, and I'm not encouraging you guys to do any of those things, although I occasionally dabbled in a few of them, you know, but I don't, you know, I took my chances and I got away with it. And, you know, where I was at, where Sean and I were at, we we're in Florence, Colorado. Apparently that particular prison is the most cigarette friendly place in America from what I hear. So that's what you, I heard you too. Could, you could pretty much smoke cigarettes and nobody, you know, the cops just turn the blind eye. They don't care. Yeah, you make know? you pull weeds, maybe extra duty clean the yeah. bathrooms remember the guy the beard guy he'd come in and he go oh, i gotcha oh, i need laugh and he'd keep walking <laughs> yeah it is, you know but i don't encourage i'm not trying to encourage you guys to like fuck up and like you know get write-ups and get caught doing some stupid shit but you you'll figure it out once you're there but definitely contra- there's all kinds of stuff there that'll make your time go by quicker and easier you know but have money you know make sure people are putting money on your books um you know, where we were at, we were allowed to spend 360 bucks a month. So if you can get somebody, you know, if you can afford it to, you know, put 360 bucks a month on your books, your life is going to be significantly easier. Um, and I'm not saying just for contraband purposes, but there's just a lot of luxuries that are going to be available for money there, you know, so you could do your own laundry and wait in line and like, try to fight the crowd to try to get in or you could pay someone a dollar fifty to do your laundry you know and fold it and so it's almost better to just pay up the dollar fifty well it's more than a dollar fifty it's 10 bucks a week tuna. if you a went tuna to the dollar 45 and oh yeah laundry for a tuna you know oh someone, yeah tunas yeah yeah someone will clean yourself for a dollar fifty you know somebody you know like if you got if you can afford it definitely put money on your account you know like your life will be significantly easier there's a lot of shit a lot of luxuries to be gotten you know so yeah and emails cost 10 cents a minute and that's 10 cents even to read the email it's 10 cents a minute to write it or read it then you got the mp3 songs what are they a buck or two a piece right you want to download music right alex right i didn't buy an mp3 player but yes that's what they were yeah i i used the amf from radio myself and just bought batteries I got a question. Yeah. Where, where um, do y'all know where, where some real good uh, lows are so I can get ready to tell my lawyer? I hear I Coleman Low sure. in Florida is not a bad one. I know a few people that have been through there. Um, the low Lompoc in California, probably another good one. Um, yeah, my co-defendants in Safford, Arizona, he says he really likes it there. He used to be, but this is all West Coast. It sounds like you're a East Coast guy, so, you know, you probably I mean, won't be sent out here, but uh, you know, my co-defendants in Safford and he used to be in Victorville, which is like, you know, like one of the worst places. And when he got to Safford, Arizona, he says he loves it. So what, what's that called? Safford, S-A-F-F-O-R-D, Safford, Arizona. Safford. Yo, is that the name of the prison? Yeah, it's the name of the city, but it's also the name of the prison. Safford, let me write that down. Arizona ain't too far. I'm in the middle of the country. You're in the middle. Yeah, just about. Well, no, I'm above uh, Louisiana, Arkansas. 
keep it wiped it down. I hear stay out of Texas. What do you uh, What do you think, Alex? What's the I worst mean, states to do time in? I don't know. I guess Texarkana is no good. You know, is what I hear. Beaumont is no good. That's just what I heard from other people. You know, I wasn't. I never actually been there, but um, that just yeah. So I heard Beaumont and Texarkana were. And obviously, Oklahoma City was the worst. Yeah. And I wouldn't want to go up. I wouldn't want to go up north where it's cold, you know, Detroit or somewhere. It's, you know, minus 11 in the winter. You said that was Safford, S A F F O R D? Yeah, S A F F O R D. Yep. What about Forest City? Does, does Forest City have a low? I think it does. I'm not familiar with that one. I don't remember anyone talking about that one in my place. What about you, Sean? Have you heard I, anything about Forest? I, I, no, I I have not. I have not. Um, don't know much about that one. I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, was it Terra Terra Hot Terra Hot Hot Out Terra Hot? Yeah, that's in Indiana. Yeah, that one. That one. I hear good things. Uh, Indiana. Yeah, that's Indiana. I don't know how you what say about, it. What about Butner, North, Butner, North Carolina? Does it have a low? I don't know. I think for I, I I don't remember anyone being from a low there. I feel like you had a medium, but it was like a medical. It was for sick people who like needed constant medical attention, is what I remember. Yeah, Bernie Madoff was there. I know they got a camp yeah, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one that needed medical attention. So it's a bunch of old people that, or not necessarily old people, but definitely sick people. You know. There's an thing to ask you, like, at, okay, another thing I want to ask, uh, add is like, they're going to ask you at your pre sentencing. If you guys haven't done your pre sentencing report, this is very important. They're going to ask you if you have any medical conditions. It's better to say no, because if you say yes, like, the more, if, the less medical issues you have, the more likely you are to get sent to a camp, it sounds like, because they camp is very independent. No one really watches over you. So you don't want to be, acting like, oh, I got diabetes or I got high blood pressure or anything, you know, you almost want to just... What if you got, got mental serious. issues? <laughs> if your medical conditions are serious, then not, maybe you should you know, own up to it, but it's better to say no. And another thing I want to add, I forgot to mention this earlier, if you haven't done your pre-sentencing report, the one thing I regret the most out of everything in during pre-trial was during that pre-sentencing interview, you got to make sure you tell the person, hey, I got a drug problem. I got an alcohol problem. I committed this crime because I wasn't thinking straight because I was fucking drinking. I was drunk. I was smoking meth. I was smoking weed, whatever, whatever your drug of choice is. But even if you're not really addicted to your drug of choice, you better say that it was a major problem in your life. And and this is why you committed this crime. I was like reluctant to admit that I use drugs. And my lawyer's like, make sure you tell them you use drugs. And I did, but I kind of played it down and it worked against me, you know? Like, so that means mm -hmm. you committed this crime because you're greedy, because you wanted to make money, because not because you were a drug addict and you didn't, weren't thinking straight. You wanted, it, that greed is worse than the drug problem. So even though it sounds counterintuitive, you got to like talk shit about yourself. Be like, dude, I fucking you know, I'm an addict, you know, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't thinking straight. I made this decision, not because the real me, the sober me would never have done this, you know, and you got to make sure you like talk shit on yourself and apologize to you. That pre-sentencing report is super important. Whether or not you get into RDAP, it all depends on that pre-sentencing report. So even if the judge says, hey, you qualify for RDAP, I recommend RDAP. If the right verbiage is not used in that pre-sentencing report they're they're going to deny you our dad they don't give a fuck what the judge says they only care what's in that report so you got to make sure that it's like you're an addict and you committed this crime only because you were high or drunk or whatever your drug of choice is you know and that's why you did this not because you're greedy and you wanted to make some easy money because if you you know that's like really will work against you so that's really important you know and, and tell them that you did not have medical problems, you know, unless you really do. And, you know, I didn't. And I made sure to like say that. And my lawyer was real adamant. Make sure you tell him you do not have any medical issues. You're independent. You don't need anybody holding your hand in prison. You could be at a camp with no 
oversight, nobody looking over your shoulder and you can like manage on your own and that'll work in your favor. So, yeah. So I just wanted to add that. And there is doctors at the camp and you will get medical, but Alex is just saying, if, if you tell them that you are all have all these medical needs, they're not, they're going to maybe put you at a medical uh, facility, you know, uh, MCC or something, which is like a medical prison. You know what I mean? You might not go to a, or a low security because you have medical needs that they don't feel the camp can meet. But our doctor was all right. It's just, you know, I mean, um, I, I don't know. I mean, they did surgeries and stuff, but there was waiting lists for everything. And it's, you know, it was, it wasn't that great of a medical, but they did, they did help you. There was guys with diabetes getting their insulin shots and all that going on there. Just wasn't the best medical, but I, you go to one of those MCCs. I don't, I don't think it's much better there anyways. Right. You know, Alex, about that pre-sentence report, um, guys have told me they they have never got the copy of it. My lawyer gave me the, it's like 16 or 17 pages. He gave me this, he gave me the blank form, you know, the, the pre-sentence report to fill out myself. He said, just fill out as much as you can, because it asks you questions like where you went to school, the names of your first girlfriends and your wife and your kids, and was there fights in your family and how did your parents treat you and every city you've lived in and all that. And then I fill it out to the best of my ability. Then I sit down with my lawyer and a probation officer and we go over everything. We add to it. We edit it. We delete it. But I'm hearing from people that they don't even get their copy. The lawyer does it for them. So you guys are listening. You need to let your lawyer know you, you want to fill that out first. I mean, he could sit across the table from you if, if he it doesn't trust you enough to have the blank form at home. And because it's 16 or 17 pages. Um, Alex, did you get the fill yours out? Yeah, by I yourself? filled it out. And you're right. It asked a bunch of all kinds of personal questions. I mean, it's going to ask you, when's the first time you ever smoked weed? Uh, tell, and not only that, like, how old were you the first time you smoked marijuana? Oh, okay, I was 14. Can you please describe the setting you were in? That's like, oh, okay, well, it was Halloween night. I was out trick or treating with my friends and someone had a joint. I smoked it. Like, they're, they're going to ask you, like, a lot of detailed questions. I mean, they might, like, Literally, they're going to ask you, you know, about your, a lot of sexual questions too, like your girlfriends, like Sean was saying, they're going to ask you all kinds of weird, weird questions. How much money you got? How much is your car worth? How much is your furniture at home worth? How much is your jewelry worth? Oh, yeah. and, and one thing I want to mention is like my co-defendant, when they asked him his financial information, he just wrote N.A. Like they said, how much money do you have in the bank? He wrote N.A., not, not applicable or whatever. And he did that on a lot of questions. He wrote N.A. And while we were getting sentenced, I got a $5,000 fine. And the judge looks at my co-defendant and goes, I can't. He's like, I've never seen a defendant refuse to divulge his financial information before. So he's like, I give your buddy a $5,000 fine, but you, I'm going to give you a $25,000 fine just because you're trying to be cute and not fill it out completely, you know? So definitely fill it out because like the judge in my case definitely was pissed off that the guy wrote NA on how much money he had in the bank because my co-defendant's father had just died. His parents had just passed away and they left him a shitload of money and like inheritance or whatever. So he had a bunch of money in the bank and he didn't want to like tell, uh, you know, tell the court system how much money he's got. So he just put N.A. because he's like, fuck that. I'm not telling him how much money I got. Well, he got a hit with an extra $20,000 on his fine. And the judge was definitely pissed about that. But they're going to ask you all kinds of weird shit. How many people owe you money? How much money do they owe you? Uh, you know, when's the, yeah. how old were you when you lost your virginity? I mean, they're going to ask you some weird fucking questions a lot, you know, and, you know, try to like, you know, try to, you know, I, I, I'm not saying be completely honest, but definitely write something. Don't leave it blank, you know? Yeah. yeah Sean, I'm still, I got I got a blank one on under all my videos. If you go to the description, scroll down there and there's a blank, uh, there's a blank one, uh, a PSR form. You could print it out. It's 17 pages long, but, or you could just click on it and look through it. Um, so you get an idea what you got to face. Tom just joined us. Tom and Alex, I did time with both these guys. Do you guys remember each other? I can't say that I do.
can't hear you, Tom. Let me uh, get him to unmute. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Tom worked in the I'm education ahead. department and also at the ADX, at the AD education there. And uh, I think you came in, uh, you came to Florence maybe right when he was leaving. I don't know. I came in March 2018. Yeah, I, I left in in May 2018. Okay, so we've seen each other, but I don't remember you just. And I wasn't working in education that last three months because they were supposed to let me go, but they kept me three extra months just for the fun of it because because they loved me so much i guess but uh <laughs> they didn't want they said they called me in and said you're leaving next week and it took them three months to to honor that commitment so uh i just i just i quit my job and i just hung out for three months i was at the weight pile in the morning and and you know reading books in the afternoon so i didn't get i didn't get to meet you i don't think alex okay what a fun place i can't say that i miss it you know, it's funny enough, it's, on the contrary, I sometimes miss it, but I just got off probation on Friday a couple of days ago, so now I think, like, I think it's getting out of my system, but there was definitely times where I missed it, you know, where I'm like, wow, I actually had a pretty decent time in there, you know, I made a lot of good friends, and I didn't hate it, and I laughed no, a lot. I, a lot I, didn't, I didn't hate it, but, you know, I being put in a warehouse where you can't live your life you know, gets gets a little old after a while, but I made it and I made it through my three years of probation and now I gotta figure out how to make a living. Yep. Yeah, Tom Alex got off a year early off his probation. Wow. Yeah. He was just telling us you, how he, you how didn't he did have that. any rest yeah. and you didn't have any restitution. I had a five thousand dollar fine, which so I used. I had a five. I was out on bail for five thousand dollars. So the day I turned myself in, they refunded that five thousand that I had put up for bail to my brother, and then my brother just used that immediately to pay off my fine. So literally the day I self surrendered, my fine got paid off. Where did you catch your case? San Diego, California. Where? I'm sorry, my phone rang. I'm sorry. San Diego, okay. California. Oh, wow. And you went to Florence for RDAP or what got you yep. all the way over there? Yeah. So my lawyer tried to get me either into uh, Sheridan, Oregon or Florence, Colorado. Well, my one of my, I had a bunch of co defendants on my case, but one of them went to Sheridan, Oregon. So they sent me to Florence, Colorado. And, and that was my second choice. Oregon was my first choice. And so I got my second choice. But then I didn't find out. So they gave me 45 days to self-surrender. I didn't find out where I was going until day 40. So into four, like five days before I was going to go, had to show up somewhere in America. I got my attorney says, okay, you got to be in Colorado on this day. And I'm like, oh shit. So I immediately bought a plane ticket, showed up like three days early, got a hotel room in Colorado, went out to some bars, some steakhouses, did some hiking, you know, like just kind of checked out Colorado since I'd never been there. And then I took an Uber to the prison, showed up in an Uber. Yeah. That's, that's quite an experience. Uh, Eric, how much more time do you have before you self-surrender? I had 45 days. I still haven't been sentenced or anything. I'm still waiting for a plea deal. Ah, so yeah. your work. Are Tom, you all these guys on here, I don't, I don't think any of them been sentenced yet. So they got, they got, they're just starting their journeys. <laughs> well, you know that uh, that negotiation is important. Uh, I played it all wrong. I talked about it last week. I played it all wrong. And I should have been more for, more aggressive in trying to work out some sort of plea agreement. I wouldn't testify against anyone, but they were still willing to talk to me about a plea agreement. And I just fought them off until a week before before the trial. And and uh, so I didn't have much negotiation room at that point. The first one. First one. Yes. Somebody have a question question out there? I hear somebody talk talking. Oh, 
Yeah, that was a new guy. He just oh. muted it. That galaxy, the galaxy, he muted it. Okay, okay. So we were talking about the pre-sentence report, Tom, and uh, like Alex was saying, uh, how important it is if if you got a drug or alcohol problem, the, you know, you want to fill out that alcohol and drug section if you want to get an RDAP because the judge will recommend everybody takes RDAP. Uh, the judge will recommend that you go to church too. And the judge will recommend that you take a history class and the judge will recommend that you walk the track and drink lots of water. None of that's going to get you in the RDAP, right? Right, Alex? <laughs> so when you get to the, to your prison, you're, you're a uh, federal property now. So whatever the judge said before, uh, you're, you're BOP property now. And yeah, Alex, there... remember our Dr. Coulter Rodriguez, who was the, RDAP coordinator of Florence, Colorado, used to say, I run RDAP, not the judge. I decide who comes in my program, not the judge. Remember that? Yeah, no, it's really important to make sure it says you got a substance abuse problem on your pre-sentencing report. There are so many guys in there that I met that were like, but the judge recommended it to me. Well, it doesn't say shit on your pre-sentencing report. So if it doesn't say it on the report, you're not getting it. Now that's a year off your life or off your sentence, you know? I only got six months, but other people get a year off. So you get, you know, you definitely wanted to say that the whatever the judge says means nothing when it comes to RDAP. You definitely want to have it written down that you have a substance abuse problem. So there was guys in there I remember that were like calling, using like a contraband cell phone to call someone back home and be like, you know, I live close to the Mexico border, so they would like have like make arrangements for someone to go down to Mexico to like a rehab center and get like fake paperwork to say that these guys were rehab in Tijuana because uh and then try to prove that they had a drug and alcohol program because they spent six months in rehab or something you know and there are people trying to do all kinds of weird shit to try to get in the program so it's a lot easier to just when you show up on your pre-sentencing report interview um tell the guy immediately i committed this crime because i have an alcohol problem i committed this crime because i use meth i committed this crime because i'm high on weed every day you know whatever it is you just got to say it even if it's not true say it it's well no don't lie weed, man don't know? take that bed away from somebody that really needs right. the program man right. don't so. don't get these guys lying yet and they haven't even you know what i mean <laughs> they're going to prison you got you got yeah. you, at some point in your life you got to stop lying so I, I i think you need to stop lying now <laughs> Well, I'm just saying, make sure you tell them you have a drug and alcohol program. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and if you can verify it somehow, even better. Uh, I think the whole world's alcoholics anyway, so everybody, there's no such thing as social drinkers. <laughs> right. I think this is a great thing that, that you're doing here, Sean. Every time I talk with y'all, or I'm just listening, I feel a little better. Till, 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 you know, Monday <laughs> starts again. But when Sunday comes and we do this, I feel a little bit better about the situation. Well, Thank you. Today, it's important that you feel good and, and make yourself feel good about your future in terms of this incarceration because it's a lot easier to get through if you're not beating yourself up or discouraged or depressed. If you have a positive attitude and make the best of it, you'll get through it a lot, a lot easier and a lot quicker. Time will pass quicker. I went in in a very bad mental state. I was I was mad. I was depressed. I was sick, and uh, I was just angry, angry, angry. And that's a hard way to do your time. And uh, there's a lot of good guys when you get there, and you'll create a little network of people that you can kind of hang with to make the time go by, and kind of watch your back and teach you the ropes of every camp has a sort of different hierarchy or culture. And so if you got some people there and kind of coach you through it, getting a good job is important. That job, that yeah. job, there's good jobs and there's bad jobs. And you want to get in there right away and find a good job. And that helps pass the time uh, a lot. Yeah. Albie's back from last week. Good to see you again, Albie. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I, okay are you now. guys got the time wrong? I, maybe you thought it's because it's almost coming up on five. Maybe you guys thought it was your time zones are wrong. Maybe you uh, think you're coming in early, but you're coming in late. That's okay. I'm glad you're here. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> not a problem. Not a problem. 
Uh, mm. So you got three guys that have been through it. You know, me, uh, Alex, and Tom have all been there, guys, what you guys are going through. So, you know, when I went through this, I had nobody. Uh, RDAP Dan talked to me a couple times on the phone. That's all I had. You know, that's why I started my channel, because he, he picked up this phone. I didn't have money to hire him, but he talked to me. But nobody understood what I was going through. So I'm starting this, you know, the support groups here. So you don't have to go through this alone, man. You know, um, here comes somebody else in the room. The meeting's getting bigger now. So you guys don't have to go through this alone, man. I, I, I know your family and friends and loved ones are, are there by your side, but they don't understand what you're going through. You know, you what know I mean? one, one time, Sean, we might have these gentlemen invite their spouse, their significant other to this call and us kind of coach them through it. Uh, and answer some questions for them and maybe help them find a better path while you're gone to, to make it a little more positive because my spouse went through a lot of frustration with it and a lot of anger with it and you know we didn't survive uh, 18 months after I got out and so uh, you know the the goal would be that your relationship is is, is stronger when you come out and, and you really need that relationship when you come out uh, it's not like you can go back out and find another woman. You're kind of branded and uh, you don't have any money probably. And, and, and you, you got a lot of issues to deal with. So it's better to keep your, your wife or your spouse or your partner, them waiting for you when you get out and have the support that you're going to need when you get out. Cause it's a little, it's a little tough when you get out. It's a, it's a lot easier to be incarcerated than when you come out at first. It's a little, little tough when you come out. Very true. Very true. Now, Albie uh, just joined us, guys. Albie, you just got sentenced, correct? Right. I did back in August, and um, I'm leaving Tuesday morning with my brother to drive from uh, New York down to Pennsylvania, and we're going to stay overnight in uh, somewhere down there by Lewisburg. And uh, Wednesday morning, uh, they said to come in by 2. I talked to a couple people out there. We're going to turn our stuff. I'm going to turn myself in around 10 a.m. Uh, in the morning. And uh, now we talked to a couple different people. One lady says you can bring some stuff in besides your legal papers, uh, a gray sweatshirt, gray pants, no logos. So I went out and got one uh, set and an extra set, white socks, some underwear, T-shirts. Now they're brand new. So if I bring them in and they confiscate them, I know they're going to be gone. But uh, they said you can bring up to $300 cash with you. And she says, depending on the doctor, it's possible you might not be quarantined and you can also uh, go right to the camp. But I'm reporting to the medium, which used to be a penitentiary. Then another guy, a friend of mine called uh, a couple of days later and the guy says, I'm 99% sure you're going to get quarantined. So uh, I don't know. And they might confiscate your stuff at the door, but I'm going to bring it anyway. If they take it, they take it. Uh, but it's, you know, it's nice stuff, underwear, T-shirts, some stuff. And uh, yeah. Sean, is it the light gray? Is it the light gray? Dark well, that's gray? what we wear as inmates there. That's our casual wear that we buy on commissary. But when I got there, they first thing they did was change me out into their clothes. And they gave me these newbie clothes, like some brown pants and a brown T-shirt that I only wear for a day or two until I get the, the regulated uniform. But I couldn't take anything in other than my shoes which I had some cheap $20 Walmart plain black tennis shoes. And then let me bring those in. What about you, yeah. Alex? Yeah. So I wanted to add, I brought a bunch of stuff in too, just like Albie was saying, but they took everything. They did not allow me to keep it. And she looked at my shoes and she goes, you know what? I'll let you keep your shoes. And I go, Oh, thanks. You know? And then she goes, ah, you know what? About a minute later, she goes, you know what? On second thought, I'm going to ask to take your shoes. And I go, are you serious? And she goes, yes, I'm sorry. So I give my shoes and she goes, do you want me to mail this stuff home to your house? And I said, no, throw it away. I don't care. She's like, we'll pay for the mail. I said, no, throw it away. I don't want it mailed to my house. I don't want anything from this place mailed to my house. So, and here's a funny story. About two weeks later, I see an inmate who works in the recycling yard wearing my shoes that they threw away. You know, this guy found them in the trash, snuck them back on campus and was wearing them. And I was like, hey, those are my shoes. He's like, yeah, well, I got them from the trash. They're mine now. <laughs> you know, so I actually seen someone wearing my shoes two weeks later. 
recycling is a pretty interesting hustle they have uh everything gets ends up in recycling whenever they toss the camp everything they confiscate they just dump over recycling and those guys sift through it and and sell you back some of the good stuff so it's kind of crazy yeah hey, we good, used seeing to have you, Tom. good seeing you out there tom <laughs> tom what did you bring your first day do you remember i i i brought some old warm-ups and some tennis shoes i i didn't bring anything in and uh i brought 300 dollars, and uh uh you know they took my tennis shoes and uh, so i wouldn't count on them not taking everything you're wearing they stripped you down into their typical entry uniform junk and give you a plastic bag full of your sheets and your towels and your you know some toiletries but that first week you got to buy a lot of stuff so that three hundred dollars gets eaten up real quick with just your your toiletries and you gotta you gotta buy you know you gotta buy some other warm ups some underwear some socks uh, you spend a couple hundred bucks just getting the bare minimums and over a period of time every month I would buy a little extra until I had a lot of stuff now when you get in there if if you're part of a gang they're gonna supply you with a lot of stuff so you get a start. Or there's other good guys in there that just have extra stuff that are going to give it to you. So, you know, uh, it's kind of good to kind of walk around and meet some people when you first get there, because some of them might give you a lot of stuff that you don't have to buy. So you might save some money if you just get some guys to, you know, you know a lot of the religious groups, for instance, uh, if you're part of a religious organization, immediately go there and find your group and start going to the chapel and, and meeting with that group. That's what I did. I, I happened to be a Catholic and they had a rosary group. And the first night I was there, I went to the rosary group and that became my little, that became my gang, but it became, gave me a little structure and a little support and somebody I at least felt I could trust. And, and so you want to develop a little bit of a social network. Uh, none of you guys look like you're involved in gangs, but, uh, if you are in the gang, you got to pretty much join the gang that you belong to when you get in there. And, and they have a pretty strict, pretty strict uh, hierarchy of what you have to do to, to earn your way into that gang. So some of it's not so pleasant. I can't talk about it, but uh, it's uh, there's a lot of stuff goes on behind those fences. <laughs> now, that's mainly the Hispanic gangs, though, in camps, guys. The whites and the blacks don't really, there's a little of that, you know, but. But I think Tom's referring more. If you're uh, if you're Mexican, you got to kind of hook up with one of those groups, right, Tom? You have to. I yeah. mean, you have to, or they'll they won't like you if you don't join them. It's join us, or we're gonna, or you're against us. So yeah, yeah. But the white guys, you know, we pretty we're the minority, obviously. Well, at least at Florence, we were, and uh, you know, we developed some small subgroups that. You know, we'd go eat the chow with or go walk the track or the other thing that was 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 a lot of fun was the sports programs. If you're a basketball player or volleyball player or baseball player, you can get in the, those programs and, and those those really help people a lot. Uh, um, I played ping pong, which, you know, just to pass the time. And, oh, and musically, if you're musically inclined, you know, they have you were at Florence, they had a pretty good music room. and. And they had some bands that got created and, and they would have concerts every once in a while out outside. And so, you know, explore around for the first week or two and figure out where there are things of interest to you. Because, you know, if you're not busy, that time starts to wear on you. I read books. I read over 200 books while I was there. And, and I had arranged before I went in to have family and friends send me a book. I gave them a book list and a long book list I, and i had them all divided up they organize it on their own so every week i got a new book to read because the library sucks so you know the library is a bunch of old dirty paperbacks and uh, uh so i i had over 200 books shipped into me over the three years i was there and that helped me a lot just reading the books i wanted to read i and then i read all the magazines and newspapers i could get my hands on if there's a magazine or a newspaper you really want, want, then you should subscribe to it ahead of time. So it's being delivered there. And uh, 
just got to plan your time because if you wake up at six in the morning and have nothing to do all day, it makes for a long day. Yeah, I agree with Tom. I think hobbies are very important. Like I, I too read a lot. I never read books in my life before, but I, I was averaging 14 books a month. I was killing it on the books. I was speed reading. I learned to speed read somehow. I've yes. never been a reader in my life, but I learned how to read books in two, three days quickly, like just going through them. Um, but you got to have hobbies. Like I was in a flag football league. I played in the basketball league. I joined a yoga class. Um, you know, I played cards. I've never really been a card player in my life. I love playing spades. I became a spades player, you know, um, you know, so you, you got to like be open to new hobbies. It's good to have some hobbies. Like I always liked playing basketball and football. So the flag football league and the basketball league was really fun. And, you know, uh, and they have like referees in the basketball league and they keep stats. They know how many points per game you score. It was cool. It was like somebody kept track of like your rebounds. I mean, so if you're into that kind of stuff, like it was really cool. And you make up all kinds of friends over there, you know, like you're not just going to be friends with the white guys or the black guys because there's going to be all kinds of dudes on your team and you're going to be friends with all of them, you know, and the guys in the league, you know, um, but definitely be open to new hobbies, you know, learn, you know, I've never been an arts and crafts guy, so I didn't, I stayed away from that stuff, but people who are into that, they were making all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, people were like, um, just be open-minded to hobbies or just have hobbies, you know, like if you don't like reading, maybe try giving it a chance. Maybe you'll like it, you know, I loved it, um, even though I never read in my life. And I got out, I don't read anymore. I only read when I was in there, but I loved it. Um, you know, but definitely be open-minded to starting new hobbies. There's so much to do. There's all kinds of activities in there. There's like horseshoes. There's all kinds of like little weird games outside. I forgot the names of them all, like, but similar to horseshoe where you throw bocce ball. Uh, there was... A, a softball league you know where they had teams and they kept stats and there was umpires and there was hecklers in the crowd I mean it was really fun uh you know like Tom said there's ping pong there's pool tables there's uh I mean there's a lot of shit to do there's definitely plenty of activities to get into and be open-minded and do them and it'll make your time go by so much quicker Sean was in a band I mean, Sean was playing music all the time, you know, so, and there's plenty of people who were doing that. Yeah, I did a couple of outdoor shows once or twice, and uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun in that, that band room, and uh, oh, everybody walks the track, that's kind of the, that's the big thing to do, right, walk the track, guys, that's just, you know, that's all prisons walk the track, but uh, that's the social thing to do, and you, uh, as you're walking the track, you find different guys and you just talk about life. It's it's funny these conversations you have that I'll never forget the conversations I've I've had walking the track. You know you know what I mean, guys? Absolutely. Hey Tom, the, uh, last week I asked you about the recreation stuff, and if you remember any of that, what time took off? Okay. Oh, uh, Alex was into that though. Uh, Alex, Albi, Albi uh, was kind of wanting to do some recreation stuff, and uh, well, you tell him, Albi, what you what you had in mind. Well, the thing is, uh, I've been lucky enough for almost fifty years now, um, uh, being official for basketball, high school and college, uh, uh, softball, umpire, soccer, referees, know the rules, and I was hoping to maybe start some kind of class. And Tom says it's a good thing you can ask your counselor. And also, the, since March, I've been going to this Gamblers Anonymous because I always had a problem with gambling. And I haven't made a bet in Christ, about almost seven months now. And I really don't have that desire. That would this really, this course helped me. And I talked to the guys tonight in my final meeting. That's one of the reasons I was a little late. Uh, they suggest that uh, years ago, they had this in prison with a GA class. And they're willing to come down and talk to the counselors or who's ever in charge down there, which I really don't know yet. Uh, and maybe starting, uh, I could start some kind of GA thing down there. There's probably people that need the help, really. And um, okay, so gambling is me. huge in prison. Sports, it's huge. I, I'm actually, I, I'm actually a fan of sports, and I'm a fan of sport gambling myself. And that was like a major thing in prison. So you're definitely going to be tempted. I mean, there's going to be a lot of temptation, maybe more so than drugs. Sports gambling and gambling in general, whether it's cards or poker or 
football games, parlays. There's going to be multiple bookies there that are going to be taking, you know, willing to take your bets. So there's definitely going to be a uh, temptation for you there just to give you the heads up. Sean started his own AA class in there. So absolutely, Sean can tell you how to start your own GA class. And I'm sure there's going to be plenty of people who have gambling issues. Absolutely. You know, um, and so, yes, you can start a class, but also I just want to make sure you understand there's going to be a lot of temptation. Gambling is huge in prison. Every type. They had guys who had a craps table. The blacks had their own craps table. The white guys had a poker table. The Mexicans had a poker table. The, every single race had their own sports bookie. The Mexicans had a sports bookie. The white guys had a sports bookie. Um, so there's going to be a lot of temptation. So, you know, if that's an issue for you, please, you know, do what you got to do to stay away. Um, and yes, uh, Sean will teach you how to open up a class because he started AA and you know, he's the only one I know that started a class. So he's the perfect guy to uh, ask about that. Sean? Yeah, this staff, I'm sure, would be more than happy to support you on that. You'd have to write to Gamblers Anonymous. I know they even have their own book now. So you, their address is, I'm sure, is printed in somewhere in that book. But before you leave out, a, you know, before you check in, go online and get their address and write them a letter. I'm in prison. I want to start a Gamblers Anonymous meeting. And I, I know if you go to your uh, your counselor, your case manager, or the associate warden, somebody will, there will back you on this because they all know that gambling goes on in prison. So this you would be doing a service to the prison. I, I I'm sure more. I know for sure they would back you on this, and they would let. And who knows? There may even be a meeting there already. Um, Gamblers Anonymous. So you know, it, it's a great program. I think it's well needed in prisons. I don't know how many prisons actually use it. But that'd be great if you could start that up. And Gamblers Anonymous will send you a starter kit. They'll send you the books, the literature, the pamphlets, the reading materials, everything you need to start a meeting. Just write them a letter. You let, you let them know what's going on. Well, they, Sean, they, they, I mean, they, uh, they approached me on it tonight and said they would be willing to get all the material and bring it down if they, the prison would be interested in something like that. And and since I've been a member there almost seven months now, I know how to run the, the program yep. uh, pretty much as far as the, the classes and things I would need. I don't know. I just didn't know if there's if yeah, You've already would be done the footwork. It sounds like you've already done the footwork. You just got to yeah. ask the right staff member in the prison. I'm sure they would back you. That's a good thing. They want those kind of things in prison. That's a healthy, that's a healthy thing to start in prison. I, I don't see why they wouldn't let you do that. Now, you know, they give you a classroom or the visiting room or the cafeteria. They'll give you a time slot, you know, and uh, and uh, they let me put up flyers all over the camp. And I, you know, had our meeting at 9 a.m. on a Wednesday and eight or nine people showed up. And, you know, um, and yeah, the staff will work with you. And it sounds I like GA is on your side. So, yeah. Yeah, that's good. I think the recreation is my forte, though, because uh, I used to go out and have to watch the, the officials and with their mechanics and their what they've done wrong, what they did good. And I would rate the guys the. Uh, uh, basically, uh, that was my job. No as, insider as bets now. <laughs> now, as far as the betting, well, like you said, there's going to be temptation, but uh, I would like to help guys even do some kind of class work where once they do get out of prison, they can maybe join an umpire and board or something where they can make extra money on the side. And it's, it, you know, it's, and it's fun to do. You get paid for having fun. Most and, people uh, get beat up in prison because of a gambling debt more than any other, uh, other kind of debt. I mean, there's drug yeah, debts and things like that, but gambling debt, that's what most people get beat up or killed for in prison. So it's big time. Yeah, if, you, if you're a gambler, you better make sure you have that money in your commissary account before you gamble, because <clears> if you don't have that money, uh, you're going to be in a very difficult position. And violence is the ultimate way they get you to pay it off. I remember, Sean, you might remember this. We, there was a guy there, I can't remember his name, and he was getting ready to leave and he had a big gambling debt and they threatened him with serious violence. And so the night before he was going to leave, he had his wife come and throw a bunch of stuff over the, the fence so he could pay off his gambling debt. And she got caught and he got caught and they went, they went back to, he went back to prison and his wife went to prison and all over a gambling debt. And he was a day away from, you know, getting out of Florence and, and he had to have his wife bring that bag so he could pay those debts. And she ended up going to prison for it. 
That happened yes. the second night I was there in prison. So that would have been May 3rd, 2017. Yeah, my second night in prison. I, they all told me the guy was getting out at six in the morning. At three in the morning, he's in the field looking for the bag that his wife dropped. And then he called her on the cell phone. Anyways, they picked him up. And yeah, I know the whole story. He got a couple extra years added on. He got sent to low. His wife got a year. Um, you know what I mean? All over. And the debt never got paid. <laughs> the de gambling debt never got paid. Right. And I remember stories of like, you know, somebody who owes so much money in gambling debt that he's desperate to pay it off. So he makes, you know, a 16 parlay bet on, you know, on consignment. Sure enough, he loses because everybody loses a 16 parlay, you know, and basically immediately when that he loses his ticket, he has to put push the button and ask to get go to protective custody because, you know, he has no way of paying that debt. He was gambling hoping to win just to pay off his earlier bets. And once he lost that, he was done. And he immediately pushed the button, you know, for the guards to come get him and take him into a protective custody to go to the hole, basically, to be in isolation. So gambling is a, you know, and like I said, in my old life, I love gambling. I love playing poker. I love sports gambling. But I stayed away from that over there for the most part, uh, just because, you know, at the poker table, I felt like, Honestly, I played one time when I first got there and I made a little bit of money, but I'm, I'm kind of cocky at the poker table. And I noticed that I'd be winning hands and I'd be kind of being cocky about it. And other inmates were getting rubbed the wrong way about it. And I realized I better not do this anymore. I better not play because, you know, you win, you get people to dislike you. That could cause potential violence in the future. So I just decided to stay away. I didn't, I didn't come to prison to make money. So I just decided to stay away and uh, you know, it kind of gets less people disliking you for some reason, because, you know, you win money off someone all of a sudden, they, you know, they feel a certain way. So I recommend staying away. But, but I think you know, people don't realize, but gambling is an emotional disease. Uh, here in New York, uh, they take it serious. Uh, you drink, that's it for an alcoholic, they, they, they drink Guys do drugs, they inject or take them down, they swallow pills, whatever they do, sniff them, whatever they do. But here, I mean, when you come to gambling, basically as much fun as it is, uh, I tell people all the time, I mean, everybody wants to win. And people say, well, you gotta be a good, a good loser. Well, you show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. There's, not some, there's no such thing as far as I'm concerned as a good loser. It could be a good sportsman in a game or something, but. Uh, if you would show me a loser who was good about it, then I, I, I just think you're looking at a loser. But it's, a, it's an emotional disease. And uh, uh, I think really, Sean, if, uh, if it's possible, even Tom might know he was in the education class, as he says, uh, to actually uh, maybe see what they would say about starting the class on gambling. And if you're saying what's going on in these, uh, from poker to craps and everybody, nobody has to volunteer to take it. But basically, if uh, they're looking for help, it's out there and these people are willing to provide all the material and things uh, to go along with. It. Yes, and I think it's gonna help by starting a class like that. I think it'll look good on, <laughs> you know, when you try to get off probation early, you know, you can add that to your, you know, argument. Hey, you know, not only did I, you know, not have any issues during my incarceration, I started a Gamblers Anonymous class. It just gives you extra bonus points, you know, when you try to get off probation early. So I think it's a great idea. And I wanted to mention, I'm not 100% sure on this, but if I'm not mistaken, the umpire for the softball league was getting paid. I think he was getting paid like $1.50 a game or $2 a game or something like that. So you actually were getting paid by the league by you know for doing it. And I remember, I'm sure of that actually. I, earlier I said I'm not sure, but I am sure that you were getting paid something to be an umpire. So you definitely can volunteer to do that basketball referees did not get paid for sure but i believe a softball definitely did so you know opportunity to make a couple of bucks legally well that's not a bad thing that's a good thing uh basically uh i'd like to go watch guys see how, see how the umpire and makes you know if they're doing out of position or if they're making great mechanic calls uh, there's things you can teach good and bad and uh, do the COs at all? Do the COs do the games, or you got the inmates that mostly do the games? See, only the inmates did the games at our place, and COs would occasionally like 
come by and watch for like one inning or something. Definitely not for the whole game. They would stick around and hang out for a few minutes, but it was, it was really fun. And there's going to be a lot of heckling. So the umpire, I hope you have, you don't have thin skin because there's going to be a lot of heckling. And some of these inmates, they got the best heckling I ever heard of any game in real life, you know, in the outside world, whatever, you know, put downs you might've heard of in your normal everyday life, you're going to hear it way worse amongst inmates, you know, but it was really fun. It was really entertaining. Yeah. You can say that again. I, I tell you some of the best ball games of my life were at that prison, you know, I, it's uh, better than, better than going to a professional baseball game. I, I enjoyed it more because it was real. It was surreal. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, guys, it has been over an hour here, and uh, an hour and twenty minutes, and I don't want to keep Alex. I know you know, uh, unless you can keep going, Alex. But uh, I thought maybe we'd wrap it up, and if you guys have some last minute questions or anything, Alex, I want to thank you so much for you know giving giving us your time today, and uh, sure, hopefully you'll come on my channel again or come back here next week or you know all that stuff. Stay in touch, even though now that you're off probation, you don't need to. You, you know, don't, don't be a stranger. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, I don't forget where I came from. Yeah. So some of the guys that joined late, just to quickly give you one, you know, the other, the rest of you guys already heard this from me, but just one more time, have as many hot, you know, be open-minded to hobbies, come and, you know, learn to play cards, learn, you know, like to read books, like to play sports, like to do stuff, definitely have hobbies and make sure when you go to your pre-sentencing interview, you tell the people that you committed your crime, not because you're greedy and you wanted extra free money, easy money. You committed your crime because you were high on drugs or drunk on alcohol, and which is why you committed your crime because you weren't thinking straight. That's the biggest thing I can say is that pre-sentencing interview is so important. It's going to make a difference whether or not you get into RDAP. It's going to make all the difference in the world. The judge will actually go easier on you because you committed the crime because you weren't in your natural state of mind. Do not, you know, downplay your addiction. Make sure you let them know that you committed this crime because of the drugs and alcohol. So, and have hobbies. And, and uh, pre-trial is the worst part of it all. Incarceration was easy. Probation is easy. Pre-trial, it was the worst out of everything that was, that I went through. This was the most difficult part of my life. It only gets easier from here. And that's all I have for you guys. All right. I'd just like to say thanks, everybody. Sean, I won't be able to tune in no more because, again, I'll be uh, self-surrendering on Wednesday uh, this coming week. So um, grab, grab my email. I'll be watching my core links for you. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I sent you one today. I don't know if you got to it yet. I anything, did. But, I did. Uh, Okay, and Tom, thank you, and Alex, and everybody. I'll be good luck. It. How many? How many? How many months you got over there? Well, they put me down for 36, uh, but it's uh, supposed to be sealed or something. They want to, they're going to amend something, and it was, I don't know the whole thing yet, and my lawyer can't really get the mathematic part done, he told me yesterday, and so uh, I just hope to, with this RDAP, I can get into that. Uh, again, I know there might be a waiting list and everything else, but uh, I think once I can get into that, and if I can even do something with the Gamblers Anonymous program, and try to get into some other programs. I'll be, uh, I just want to keep active and uh, help umpire do anything I can do to, like he said, what Alex was saying with the hobbies and everything. So I appreciate you guys, Sean, keep up the good work. And um, thanks again, Alex, for the info. And um, Got it. appreciate everything. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. Thanks, all right, man. Alex, guys. Tom, all you guys, Eric, Alan, God bless you guys. I'll see you next week. See you on YouTube. Thanks guys. All right. See you later.